Welcome to the Loud Noise Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Walsh. Loud Noise is where I dig into conversations with some of my favorite musicians. Our goal is to share experiences and ideas that you can use in your own creative development. From breakthroughs and challenges to successes and lessons learned, you'll have a front row seat to the best show in town. I'm a guitar player, writer, producer, living in Prague, Czech Republic, via Nashville, via New York City. I've spent my life living the dream and making music. I've had a lot of help along the way, and this is a chance for me to share some of what I've learned with you. So let's crank it up and join me in welcoming today's guest for some loud noise. My guest this week on Loud Noise is singer Lucy Woodward. Lucy has a career that is incredibly diverse and unique. Her bio would take up the whole show, so here's the Cliff Notes version. Lucy was born in London to musical parents, grew up in New York City, and went to Manhattan School of Music for a hot minute. Lucy became a fixture on the New York scene, beloved for her warm, soulful, smoky voice that was equally at home in jazz, R&B, and rock. She signed a record deal with Atlantic Records in 2003 and scored a top 40 hit with her song, Dumb Girls. A world tour and late night television appearances ensued. Realizing she wanted to dig deeper into her artistry, Lucy followed up her debut with a string of releases that showcased her depth as a singer, collaborating with producer, keyboardist Henry Hay, producer Tony Visconti, and singing with Pink Martini, Rod Stewart, Snarky Puppy, and the Tiptoe Big Band, to name a few. Currently, she's out on tour supporting her latest recording, Music, 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 a collaboration with Charlie Hunter. Having completed a whirlwind tour of Europe, they're currently on tour in the U.S. The music is soulful, funky, and fun. Honestly, I'm only scratching the surface, but as you can see, Miss Lucy Woodward ain't messing around. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Lucy Woodward. You're unique because you function on both sides of all of this because mm. you're an educated, smart singer who can work for other people. You do your own thing. You've had your record deal. You've done independent projects. You've got so many different things happening and how you've evolved and stayed relevant and keep developing yourself and the pursuit of your artistry is super interesting. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you. Sometimes you're in it and you don't even like realize what the fuck is going on. But yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, and I, I do talk about this in my, like, I do, like you're talking about teaching some of these master classes, and I have these young people and sometimes they're not so young. It's between 16 and, you know, 40, but they're just trying to organize their brains and how, how they can, they're hungry for knowledge and they're hungry for doing new things. And I think also what you, we talked about, you know, even just earlier when we first got on the phone was just jumping into different pockets and projects. And I, I always kind of always want to lean in that direction. Not It's not for everybody, but I can multitask. And <laughs> I've always, I don't know, probably you had this a little bit also in New York growing up or spending your you know younger years there. It's like you jump into everything that you can do. You're playing with everybody. You just don't say no. You just do it. And that's part of that New York DNA, which is such another kind of post-college education. Absolutely. So you grew up in New York, Mm -hmm. but did you, you went to music school in New York, right? We moved from Westchester to the Bronx when I was 14. So then I went to Manhattan School of Music. I was accepted, strangely, a year early, like after my junior year. I kind of did my senior year of high school and my freshman year of Manhattan School of Music at the same time. And I did kind of an early audition in the jazz department. I kind of, I still don't know how I got in there, but I did. And it was, um, um, I had to, you know, scat for 16 measures, you know, and do an ear training and a theory test and things like that and sing a few songs. And um, it was actually too difficult for me to really stay on top of things because they also were heavy, heavy you must breathe bebop all the time, which was not my thing. And I just wanted to sing Aretha. And so I actually just, I dropped out after a year. So by the time I was maybe 17 and a half, I was, you know, hitting the streets and maybe 18, you know, I was 
singing in cover bands and just starting to join a wedding band and starting to do sessions. And so it was pretty young and I, I just knew I didn't want to be in jazz school. <laughs> but, um, but then of course I got into singing, you know, after it wasn't shoved down my throat, I learned every just jazz standard I possibly could. And I started doing my own like coffee shop gigs and singing in Italian restaurants on Bleecker Street and things like that, you know. So maybe that's a little bit later, like 20, 21. And that was where I really fell in love with just singing with a pianist or a guitar player and learning about my voice. And these songs were written for vocalists, the lyrics, you know, every Cole Porter tune, they were written for, um, the voice. And, uh, that was sort of a whole other different education for me, but, but yes, to answer your question, I did. I went to high school and public, public high school in the Bronx, public school in the Bronx, uh, with a hardcore like choir and after school music program, and then went to Manhattan school of music and moved to Harlem. Mm-hmm. In the short time you were at Manhattan School, did you meet some musicians that you continued to play with at, around that time, or? You know, I was so young because I was sixteen. So it's I was, really young. I yeah, and I was living in the dorm on 110th Street, and there were only eleven jazz singers at that time, and you know, some had come from Berkeley and some had come from actually one of the Ray Letts, one of Ray Charles girls was coming, going back to school at age 60 something. So everyone was just curious about what this school had to offer. And then I'm here 16, kind of like, you know, (laughs) not, not quite sure what my sound was at all. Um, but, um, I think at that time they didn't really know what to do with the singers because they were putting me in a theory class with you or, uh, you know, an ear training class with like a Henry Hay type, you know, that kind of thing where sure. And someone who already, and someone, yeah, through their own studies have maybe already been exposed to a lot of this information. Yeah. That's it. That's interesting about music schools now because there's so much more organized, just, you know, it was a little bit of the wild West back then. Berkeley was very similar. Yeah. But Berkeley had this sort of a a commercial, department a little bit right it was yeah it was totally also, yeah yeah, yeah you, you, i think manhattan was trying to do that and uh it just you know i remember bringing you know you have to be a part of a jazz ensemble every friday and they were like okay what do you want to sing and i was like well how about i never loved a man you know aretha and what about this you know it's like a broadway jazz standard kind of and they were like can you just do my funny Valentine, you know, keep it simple. And I was like, I actually don't even know if I really know that, you know, of course I learned it later, later, but you know, they really, they didn't know what to do with these people who wanted to not sing. Sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, definitely. Berkeley had an advantage with that for sure. Um, And at that particular time too, particularly the rock thing was a little out the window, but R and B was really strong, which was great. But playing in a, playing in a wedding band or a cover band, is so important in terms of just, so oh my God. you learn, I mean, you learn everything you need to know about how to do a gig without having, you know, your own creative skin in the game, so to speak. You know, you just learn the, how it works and you learn repertoire and you learn tunes and you learn some of the best songs ever written. Totally, ever. And as um, that, I always, I think it's the best education you can get as a, vocalist you have to learn how to project in front of a band how to listen to players if you choose to you have to take orders from your band leader you have to be graceful you have to um and i'm just talking like as a musician um learn every key learn all the harmonies memorize lyrics your muscles are being used every uh every step of the way and that on that scene is where I met, once I joined a wedding band, that's where I met my peeps who I'm still so close with now. Henry Hay, Tim Lefebvre, I mean, like, you know, Zach Danziger, like we're all just, those are my peeps forever, you know, and they always will be. Marianne Bennett. Um, so there's so many, so many special people that came from that because we all, you know, there, there are some people who just do the wedding band thing and that's fine, but they, and they, are making a killing living. But when they're, when you find your tribe on stage of people who want to do other stuff outside that world or weird stuff outside that world, they know, you know, then 
th- those are the people I was drawn to, or they bring their outside world to the wedding band and the band leader is awesome enough to let them do their thing and be artists as long as they're playing boogie yogi and the right chords. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. it's, you know, those are the people that I was always drawn to the quirks. The quirks yeah. In, yeah. 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 I remember around the time I met you was as things were kind of ramping up with your own original project um, before you had signed your first record deal. Well, I, I think it was your first record deal. I'm not sure. Um, and you got a, you had a unique experience in the sense that you got to see what that was, what that was like. I think there's, there's so many artists that got signed to record deals in that last part of the nineties, um, when it was still a, not a normal thing to have happen, but it it was something that could actually happen to somebody. Mm. Had you been aimed at trying to do that specifically? Or how did that, because I know you were really active playing your own music in New York City at that time. Wow, you remember more than me. It's sort of like, you know when you go like, you're just, you're in this robot world. I'm going to go to the studio, I'm going to write songs, I'm going to go to my gig, I'm going to hang out with my band. And, you know, there's like, you're just in this kind of world bubble. And I think that's the, the age that I was also, I'm just, I couldn't even call it driven. I just did what I did because I wanted to. And just let's go play music somewhere. You know, it's like you don't even, you're not even thinking about a living. You're not thinking about, you're just playing music. It's weird. Um, you know, I I remember I had my friend E. Talsher um, and I had a band called, it was like a long working title called Etolaton, which is his first name. I was singing backup. I was singing lead. We played Izzy Bar. We played Shine on Canal Street. We played, it was like a funk scene. Etol came, he was one of the original founders of Groove Collective. He was a piano, the keyboard player. So there, he came from this whole funk scene. We met when I was maybe 24 and he said, will you come be in my band? It's super fun funk band. It's going to be like, like funky disco Fleetwood Mac. It's all about the songs, the harmonies. We're going to have a DJ in the band. We can wear afros. We can wear crazy wigs, whatever we want, you know, and that was sort of a, that was the first original band that I was in around that time. He was also, he wrote for Maxwell and he had also written Santana's, um, song smooth. And because he won a Grammy with that song and that this is like the 20 year anniversary, like this year, which is crazy. Um, he uh, he was offered every record deal under the planet to have a production company, um, and so he we, he s- signed with Epic Sony, and I would be the first artist as a solo artist that he would produce under this umbrella under Epic Sony. So I had this very strange, very fast, ha- you know, deal with Epic, where Tommy Matola signed me, and Etal and I had to sing songs for him in his office. And then, uh, but the week before that was the Grammys and Jimmy Iovine, uh, invited us over to his house, went to the Grammys with Etal and his family because we're all really close. And we went to Jimmy Iovine's house for dinner and Etal and I played songs on his white piano or whatever it was in that, in his living room. And so there was kind of like this weird bidding war. We went with Epic Sony at, at, with Tommy Matola. um, and then sign this deal working on demos. And then that deal just sort of went away. I actually don't even remember what happened. I just remember I just wasn't on the label within a year. It just, you know, you don't even think about stuff. You you feel like it's the end of the world because, oh, this is what it's like to be dropped. But there was barely a record even made. And then um, by that point, I signed with Judy Stakey at Warner Chapel. So because I was signed as an artist, not as a songwriter to Warner Chapel, it was her job to kind of say, okay, now we have to get you another record deal to basically recoup the money that we just gave you as a, as a, as a publishing house. And, um, so Judy Stakey, who is, you know, a mentor, uh, and, you know, incredible publisher and sort of auntie. Um, how did you guys, she, how did you guys first meet? How did we first meet? Judy and I met, I think Kathleen Murphy was my A&R person at Epic Sony, and I think they connected us. I think there were a lot of women songwriters in my life. Um, Shelley Pikin, who I wrote a lot of songs with for my first record, you know, wrote songs for Christina Aguilera and just so many hits, The Pretenders. And and so Kathleen Murphy, Shelley Pikin, and Judy Stakey, somehow we all made that connection. So Judy 
had just signed Michelle Branch and she had, she was very close with Sheryl Crow and had signed her, um, Jewel. So it was kind of that era, late nineties, early 2000 sort of era. And she said, so she signed me, but I had lost that deal. So she said, okay, we're going to go get you another deal. This is my job and I'm going to do this. So we're going to go to the mall. We're going to get you a new outfit. We're going to take, I'm going to take you around because I don't know what I was wearing at that time. And we're going to take <laughs> all the pink and green out of your hair because I had like this weird skate girl thing going That's on. Right. Skateboard. That's right. <laughs> Remember this pink hair? So she's like, we're going to get rid of that. And, and so, um, but I kind of did what she said. I mean, I was like, Judy knows best. And, um, it was kind of over that look anyway, but she, um, but then we went around to every record company office and sang songs, me and Tad DeBrock and, um, eventually Kevin Kadish, I had met him and we were doing the same thing. So I was going around to different labels in LA and New York and singing for people and them saying, thanks, but no thanks. You need more hit songs. So I did that for such a long time. And during that time, 9-11 happened and the whole thing was, we're not signing because everyone was just freaking out about the world, understandably. And um, that that was the beginning of, uh, you know, oh my God, I'm in the, the record industry. This is, this kind of blows. But I keep, I keep doing my gigs. I keep doing whatever I need to, 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 uh, to just make music and write songs and be in that world. So it's such a different brain being in the industry and then just like hanging with your friends and doing gigs at the bitter end and such a different world. And then there's the, the paying your bills part of it and doing sessions and doing jingles and wedding bands and how you make it all fit. I have no idea. You just, um, you just have to make it fit. I, I mean, that's how I always felt about it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because a lot of people may not, um, we understand, I understand what you're saying when you say this blows is, not everyone may understand um, what the what that other side of the coin is with the music industry when you have yourself so encumbered with these types of companies. What what are the downsides? There are upsides. I'm not trying to paint it as a as a bleak thing, but but there are downsides when you're in the situation you are in. Yes, you mean at that time, like yeah, with regards to record companies and deals and things like that. Yeah, the you know yeah. you're you you're somewhat at their mercy. Yeah, that is it. Um, I, uh, I mean, there's amazing things that happen and then so many weird things that happen. Um, I eventually signed with Atlantic records, which is, was like the first time I got on the radio and John Shanks and Kevin Kadish did my record and that, that sort of top 40 world. I was in that world very fast. Ahmed Erdogan, I had his final blessing and, you know, it was one of these really magical evenings where Tad DeBrock, Kevin Kadish, and I sang this song that Kevin and I wrote um, 11 times to different heads of the uh, of this Atlantic Records and the radio department and the publicity department. And then we sang our final version of this song acoustically up in on the top floor in Ahmet Erdogan's office. And the next day there was a deal on the table. And Everything happened in that world. This is about probably 2002. Everything happened so fast. And I think, and I always say that record deal came in so fast, whirlwind like crazy. Jay Leno touring Japan, the whole thing. Um, and then it went away just as fast. I mean, it just was gone within nine months. It was like just done. So during that time, every door open because you're now the new darling of the new this and all that whole business. And because I had done so much session work, backup singing work, I was still like super musician. I wasn't born. I wasn't like, I'm going to be a star. I wasn't that girl at all. And so it, I was always grounded in the sense of, I'm sure things got to my head because people tell you you're so young and people are telling you you're so great. Oh my God. I'm a, you know, I'm sure things were, you know, it's just natural. You're just such a kid. And, but at the same time, it was always music first. And I always wanted to make sure my band was happy. That's all that I ever cared about. If I was, if I heard someone was upset about something or I always wanted to make, they were always first. So those things are who you are. I'm still like that. You just, those things don't change. Um, because I always found your, your mates are your, 
the most important people around you more than your manager, more than your A&R person. It's your, it's your people who you play with every night on stage. Um, so, but you know, joining, uh, signing to Atlantic, you know, big million dollar record deal. Not that they gave me that money, but you know, towards the video and the whole thing. And, um, the big, the hardest thing at first, because I had a lot of these songs written, I had been writing with John Shanks already for years and a lot, and these songs were done. We just had to go bang them out. And, uh, the hardest thing, which I know happens to every female and I have no problem talking about this, but they say, okay, you have to lose 20 pounds basically by next Friday. So we've, you know, you're, we've gotten you the most fancy mem- gym membership ever. You're going to be meeting with a trainer three, four times a week, a nutritionist, the whole thing. You need to lose 20 pounds and be, if you're going to be on MTV, you have to look super skinny. And so that was really, you know, I had grown up with eating disorders and all that. So your whole your whole brain is like, Oh my God, this has nothing to do with music, you know, but you do it. And I remember being with like my trainer and jumping rope and crying from exhaustion. You know, I was just like, I'm so hungry and I'm tired and I just want to sing, you know, he's like, come on girl, let's get through this. It was like real, real, real boot camp. I never pushed myself so hard. You do a video, you do them some things and, um, you're in that you're just in that world, but you have to do what they say because they say, we've just spent so much money on you. You have to give us this. And you're like, wow, this is deep. This isn't even like, hey, can you write more, you know, better songs? This is like, hey, can you lose 20 pounds yeah. by the first of the month? It was yeah. like, can you, so be, do- can you become a different person for me? Right. I know we signed exactly. you for the, yeah, totally. Yeah. I know we love your voice, da, 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 but you got to do this for us. Um, that was the hardest thing because it's like, it's so psychological. So, um, you know, we're just so I mean, everybody now, I can't even imagine being on, having a deal so young in this day and age because everything is on social media and everyone's just trying to look perfect all the time. That was someone telling you, yeah, you're great. You're fat. Can you, you know, and I wasn't even fat. It was just a very, you know, so psychologically it was, you know, it was so mean. Totally. (laughs) So, you know, anyway, so you get, that was, I remember that, um, being the, probably the hardest part of it all. The rest was just go and get in the van, 5 a.m. plane, go here, go sing on the air at this station at 7 a.m. There is a game that you're playing, but it's part of, I remember being in a radio tour with Tad and Kevin Kadish for like seven or eight months. It was nonstop radio, every city, land, maybe three cities a day, just drive, 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 radio show at night. That was the way they pushed that song and that record on radio. And then when the when it stops getting the spins that it did and they try to push a second single and no one's really playing that single, it's over. So I don't know. You know that's it. It's done. So you start writing for the next record, but you get dropped anyway. So they're, you know. I'm acting like I'm super jaded now. I just I'm I'm not at all. No, I'm no, so I, I think I, I, but I think I think you're giving a really a really pragmatic you know version of it because, and all and also something that was happening at that time in the music industry to consider too is it was destabilizing itself and there was forces at work that were way beyond anything an individual could control. On the on the inverse of that, I think the cool thing that it seems like you've done is because you are a musician and because you were already, you know, doing gigs and sessions and all of this before any of this actually happened, it seems like you've developed really good relationships with the talented people that were in your life at that time. And you've been able to maintain those relationships. Definitely. And that's what it's really about. That that's everything. You never know how things come back around. I mean, it's, it's, um, and I was, I was curious and even almost more selfishly is, um, like if I if I took two or three people in particular, like if I take um, Shelley Pikin and John Shanks and and Kevin, who I know a little bit, um, what were what were something you specifically um, got from the experience of working with these people? Mm. Um, I had never really. Let's see. When I met Shelley, she was bringing me to John's studio at Henson. So Shelley and I met for a coffee before. And she's like, tell me about yourself over a coffee. And she is, she's still, we're very, very close. Um, she, 
God, we wrote this song called The Trouble With Me, which was on my first record, that first record. And we get there and we just start, um, John is an obviously amazing guitar player and he just starts grooving on this thing. And I just kind of start rapping over a melody, rapping meaning it was like literally two notes or one note. It was just a rhythm. And um, I was really listening to a lot of Cheryl Crow. I mean, she I still worship her. She's amazing. And then Shelly was just diving in. She would she would kind of jump. She'd sit and she'd sit on this couch, and she would pick up on my rhythm, my pace. And when I write, I um, go for vowels and rhythm first. I might not even be some people. I wish I could do this, but they write the lyric and the melody at the same time. I've never been that girl, but words pop out and vowels start to, um, develop in just actually in singing. So she was, she was naturally picking up on this kind of rap that I was doing and making sense of it. And no one had really done that with me before. So I remember John's like, ding, 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 ding. and I was thinking that I want you, you know, I was just mumbling and she made a whole thing out of thinking that I want you, but you know that I could have got what I want or whatever. And she had this play on the words and, and she just took, it was like reading my diary, my rhythmic diary in my head. And she just put words, you know, and that whole song is, so much about what happened in the previous hour and over coffee and not about that, but she could tell who I was in that coffee hour before we got to the studio. And that is a real, real, real songwriter. You're working with an artist. She's set up by the label to work with this person. She doesn't know who's never really worked with like lots of professional, uh, writers. And it's her first time in LA and that these songwriters, they do the rounds and she came in and she just dove right into my brain and dove right into my musical way of rapping. I'm just, I keep calling it rap because I didn't have a melody yet. And, and John is just like the rock of grounding, you know, grounding that, um, ground, making that foundation super strong. So that song was done like in an hour. It was so cool. Called The Trouble With, with Me. It was so not, that combination was really great. We all knew that. We continued to write more songs. With Kevin, also, he is in that moment. He's one of those writers that melody and lyric come at the same time. He also was doing kind of his solo thing and doing playing Mercury Lounge. And and I always was like, you need to be a solo artist. You're an amazing singer. You have a hell of a presence. You're such a good songwriter. You know, and he chose, you know, he, he did that for a while, but then went and did the, the, you know, really was getting successful as a songwriter. But the same the same thing in that moment, they just know how to tap into your brain and whatever you're mumbling around inside your brain or whatever mumbles outside of your mouth, they know how to take that and turn it into something special and can read you and can read the room. And that's what though. I think that's what, I mean, songwriters should do that, whether they're writing for themselves or they're writing for other people or with other people. But that is certainly a way of, um, them reading the artist and listening to what is really happening because whatever was coming out of my mouth was different than the girl who they were working with yesterday. I didn't really know that though, because I didn't know how the business worked. But, um, all I knew is that it was the warm, glowy, physically warm, soulful feeling of, oh, wow, this is a song, you know, sure. this is a song and there's a demo and there's an ADAT <laughs> with my <laughs> voice on it, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, um, but they all have such a unique way of tapping into, um, the artists that they're working with. I've seen it a million times over and over. Totally. It's like, yeah, those, the, those writers. Totally. It's like the antenna antennas go up and they're just on intake. And I think too, it's, um, I don't know if you had this experience, but I feel like the, f the first thing, um, that always struck me when I started to write, um, as a younger writer, I'm writing with, you know, these types of people, you know, at this level is it's so important to keep things moving and to not be too precious about things. And there's something about momentum. It's like when you, 
when you stop, that's when you get into trouble. Right. It's like it's like as soon as the silence is deafening. Yes. You know, yes. it's like keep pushing, keep moving, keep moving towards uh towards uh, um just keeping keeping the flow going, getting a flow yeah. going and and don't judge it and don't worry about it and you can always do do something else, but you know, yeah. let's follow the thread and get it done and then you can move to something else before you start nitpicking it. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting, because I was writing a lot in New York, just like with my friends or even some people that I've been doing demos for and things like that. And I find that New York had a really different way of working um, that people are like, let's get this song done. Let's drip. Let's go all the way. OK, we'll eat later. You know, there, there was a whole just go, 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 go. And that was this New York, you know, tough way. I was raised like that. Also, you just get do it till the job is done. Then I started going to L.A. and you get to this place of, OK, this is great. Oh, my God, we have a song. Let's go eat. Let's talk about the song. Then let's come back. And people, they take, there's like a break. Breaks happen. <laughs> Nashville's very similar that way. And you know what? It was funny. It was a revelation to me when I moved to Nashville. I have to say that, and it, it made me sad. It was completely normal for a singer, songwriter, independent artist to have baby publishing deals, where in New York, nobody had these. And it was just mm -hmm. like, this makes complete and total sense that all of my friends, the equivalent of the New York version of these people, if they lived in Nashville, they would all have a you know twenty thousand dollar, you know, baby co pub deal or something, and they could it would at least be a stipend to keep it going. And I was yeah. like, this is great. This makes this just seems humane. Yeah, right. It's so civilized. Yeah, and a lot of those people would end up you know, getting cuts mm -hmm. on other records for other artists and that would help facilitate or they get a sync or like it would be so foreign for like New York. I I hope it's changed in some way, but it, in our time, it was very rare for anyone to even understand what a sync license or any of that to, you know, to get your song in a yeah. TV show or a movie where in LA and Nashville, this is completely normal and it can, and it funds it. Yeah. And it funds your whole thing. Yeah. Totally. So that that was I don't know that that was something that always seemed very, very strange. And I think New York is fundamentally different from these other places. And you know that's a little little sad. But um, I know I know. You know what you said about um, you know starting to say no to certain uh, jobs is a big part of moving to the next level in doing what's right for your music, what your, and your art. Um, I remember there was a time that I was doing, I was singing demos for a lot of songwriters in New York and uh, some in LA, but I was in New York a lot. I, that's where I lived at that time. And I remember singing, I mean, pop um, people were writing for Jessica Simpson and writing for Britney Spears. And I could imitate that to a certain extent. So I would do these sessions and then I remember going, I don't even know who my sound, what my sound is anymore. I don't know. I don't know what my sound is. So I actually think I need to back off from these sessions and just eat out less, you know, and you know, I can't, I actually can't do this. I'm actually really getting depressed and I'm starting to pull the same old tricks out of my vocal hat, you know, and sure. I, what am I doing? Wait a second. What, you know, and, um, Jingles is one thing because it's sort of, it's quicker, it's fun. You could be a different personality and I always, oh I still do jingles sometimes. It's, um, it's great way to make money and the, the SAG after healthcare system was fantastic and the union is fantastic. So, I mean, there were really big reasons to do that kind of work. But when it came to song demos for pitching for Britney Spears, um, that was getting to be really hard for me because I didn't do anything like that type of music. Um, and I remember my last demo I ever did was my friend Shelly Pike. And again, she hired me to come sing a song that she was maybe pitching to Jessica Simpson or something. And I'm like, Shelly, I'm, I'm going to, I love you. I'm going to do this for you, but I'm like not doing demos so much anymore. And, and, uh, she goes, great. Don't worry. We'll make this quick in and out. Bing, bang, bang, bang. And so she, um, we were in LA and I remember I sang for five minutes and she came into the booth and she said, Lucy, I love you. You're my favorite singer ever, but you're not the right person for this song. And I knew they were belting like, 
you know, the melody was like belting high C's, sharps and D's. And that definitely is not my world. And, um, and she said, I, I don't even want to waste your time, you know? And I was like, I love you for being so honest with me. And that was it. I'd never did that kind of work again. I said, I, now I know I can't do it because I'm actually relieved I'm so relieved that I'm relieved from the session. You know? <laughs> totally. I'm relieved that I'm released from the session. And um, and it was like I wasn't even offended or hurt. I was like, good, this is it. I just got fired from a job, and I'm like, going to really start saying yes to only the things that I want to do. Sure. And I was so psyched. I was like so psyched and proud of myself for being cool with it. Like it was – you know, anyway, it was a, it was a, I remember really feeling a change in who I was and what kind of work. Well, you know, it's important too, because I used to, I, I would, cause you said this earlier is like in the beginning, you got to do everything because you have to just build the muscle. And number two, you yeah. just because you think you know what you want to do, it's probably not what you actually should be doing. Yeah. Like you've got to find it, but at a certain point you've got to, you got to make that change. And that, Often that transition is a little unwieldy. You know, you overcompensate. I know for myself, there's moments where I overcompensated and it was too much or it wasn't enough and you got to find that balance. But um, I think one thing that's really important in terms of kind of finding that line of who you are and what you're trying to do is um, it's really, it helps determine who you actually are. And it really galvanizes, you know, your sense yeah. of self. And that's the key is what you're saying to me is yeah. um, sometimes I believe that the closer you get to doing what you really want to be doing, but it's not that, is actually much more difficult and emotionally challenging than if you were doing something completely unrelated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like if you want to yeah. be doing your own music and you're you know, just doing sessions for other people. It's like, I'm in the place where you do this, but I'm not doing that. And it's like, oh, it would be cooler to just be in some banged up blues band somewhere. (laughs) Totally. Oh my God, what I would kill to be in a like banged up blues band somewhere. Like I would like love to do that. You know what I mean? Just because it's so real, you know? Yeah. But it's a, it's, um, it's definitely part of, you know, I think from doing all those sessions and backup world and wedding world and, you are building your chops and then you have the tools. It's like you have your, I had like my little toolkit to go out and do those things and get those jobs. And then there's the other world of the record. I was in and out of record deals and jo- I mean, I've, I've had like five record deals, like drop signed, drop signed. And, but the muscles that you build mentally, psychologically and musically, emotionally, physically that you build at that time, um, especially in New York and especially like raised the way I was raised. It was just like, you just keep going. And it's funny it, the way I'm talking is if I'm like determined, fierce, you know, career chick, which parts of me of course like are whatever. But, but when I met people who were sort of the backstabby, there's something really wrong about them. They're doing things for the wrong reasons. They're, they're, they're so blind, blinded by like stardom or just power. You meet those people and then, I don't know if I'm going off subject a little bit, but you realize that you're actually doing okay. Totally, because, totally. Sorry, there's a European ambulance going by. You can hear that. Did you hear that? We're so European. You it's can, We're so European. Anyway. There, you're that, definitely not in New York City or Los Angeles. York, <laughs> definitely not. I love it. And, um, So, but you, you, you realize when you see that and you see someone just so hungry for power and fame and being the best and competitive, like that's also one thing with me, I'm competitive in my world because I have to be only because it's the nature of the beast, but I'm actually not a competitive person. I don't need to be the best. I don't need to be, have the job over the next person. I don't need to be, I don't, I've never, I'm not, I hated taking tests in school. I've never needed to be the best at anything. I never really felt that. I just like did what I did and hopefully good things came from it. And I think when I saw that in other um, people, it kind of scared me. Um, 
it just like scared me. And I said, you know what, I'm, it, it kind of, it taught me, uh, like I'm doing, I'm doing okay. Like this is okay because I, I, I realize and I like myself, <laughs> I like what I do and I have so much to learn. I have so much to grow, but, um, there's so much more to grow and learn, but I, but I actually, I'm okay with where I am. You know what I mean? It kept me grounded from when I saw fierceness, like mean fierceness in other people, I was like, I'm, I'm doing all right. You know what I mean? Totally. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting too, because an unfortunate byproduct of being a musician, a musical person is, and particularly if you're in a singing role, because by default you end up being looked to as a leader or as the, the vehicle of which the thing revolves around you're put into this other position of being the performer or the artist or whatever you want to call it. And that's completely at odds with the process of being on the path towards mastering something. They're completely unrelated where I think a lot of people that are, um, you have artistry, but that's not being an artist and being an artist, I would say a good 60 to 70% of that has nothing to do with music. So it's like, so if for me to do my music thing, I've got to adopt all this other stuff. And that sounds kind of like a drag, but it's, you know, you're conditioned to want to, you know, you're conditioned to have to take that on. And yeah. that's kind of a bummer. It's a drag. And for you, because you've got all these other skills, you are able to, you've evolved and done all sorts of different things beyond this first record deal and all the other things you've done. Like you've done... Um, side person work for other artists and I'm sure you bring a lot of compassion and, and um, empathy to those situations do you like working with other with other singers I do oh my god I mean did you remember did you see this documentary um, 20 feet from stardom yeah it's amazing amazing I saw it three times in the theater on the first week and um, it was just beautifully done and anybody listening who's curious about the brain and the world of a backup singer, this is the movie. Um, I love singing with singers. My mom was an opera singer. Um, I grew up singing out of the womb. And uh, I love blending and I love blending with singers. I do. I, I, I love that. I love singing in a group. I love singing with two people, with a choir, whatever. Um, there's just such an energy. There's like a frequency in the room that you do not get when it's just you. It's a different kind of feeling physically. I, um, I've always liked singing backup for people because I also like to blend. Well, there's so many aspects of it. Um, I like stepping away from Lucy, the solo artist. I do like that a lot. I like, especially when I'm backing up somebody else's, who's a great singer. Like I sang with Rod Stewart for four and a half years and he's a great singer. And I think he kind of dug me because I got the rasp thing going on and I could do the, you know, that rock bluesy raspy thing. I think that it was a good blend. And there were times when I would double him or I knew that if he was getting like a little tired in the house, maybe they would bump me up a little bit. There was a tone that I know that we matched. And um, if I was really vocally tired or if he was vocally tired, we would always talk about it because touring is wear and tear. I mean, he's doing obviously way more singing than me. But if he heard that I had a cold or if, or if somebody had a cold, he would always say, be careful of your voice because he knows as a raspy type of singer, the way we sing, um, it can be damaging just by talking too much, by talking too much after a show, after you've been singing for two hours straight and then you go party after uh, the show for an hour, that is damaging right there. So we talk about steroids, we talk about anything vocal rest about steaming. I saw him two weeks ago and we're still talking about it, you know? And so it's a real, it's a, it's just like this nonstop. This is how do you take care of yourself as a singer? Some people are just born. They can have a sh Shaka Khan would smoke a cigarette and she'd have a shot of whiskey and she'd sing a high belting A. Some people are just born like that, you know, and I have to work harder to maintain my instrument. Um, how did I get on the subject? I have no idea. But 
anyway, it's just a, there's a camaraderie with working with other um, singers or or singing backup for somebody else. There's like a teamwork. You have their back. You have their back. And that's also refreshing to not make it about you. I loved taking that rod job. It was the right time. I went in as a sub for like nine months. One girl had a baby. She came back. The other girl left and had to get a, a sur- spinal surgery. So after nine months, he's like, you know, if you want the job, it's it's yours. You can have it. And I had to think about that because I had already been doing this like solo career grind, go, 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 get signed, get job, get signed, keep going, write songs, you know. And when he offered me the job, um, full on, I was like, I have to really think about this. Can I do this? Will I, do I want to do this? This is, it would be nice to make a salary. Um, and it would also be nice to not think about my solo world for a while. Sure, sure. I oh my it. God. And I, yeah, yeah. In your experience, um, I think singers have special connections with one another beyond the singing, like in a situation with Rod Stewart, for instance, for example, um, do you feel like you had a different, the singers had a different relationship with him than, than the band did per se? Well, he is such a singer's singer. Um, people might think he's like, you know, sex symbol, especially early on. And, you know, he has a lot of energy. He's dancing on stage. He never sits down. Um, so there's this performer entertainer. He tells jokes. He's so British. Um, he's a storyteller. And then, but he is really a singer singer like him. And I talk a lot about, you know, songs by Cole Porter and Hammerstein. And we talk about the songs that were written, like I was talking about earlier, the songs that were written for singers. So he loves voices. And I think that we, that is something that, um, he always wanted to talk about Sam Cooke. If you listen to him, he's really Sam, Sam Cooke is his, he sounds like Sam Cooke, like early Sam Cooke. And I can hear the things that Rod does imitating Sam in the early part of his career. Rod later did these standards records and he really sounds like Billie Holiday to me. It's always Billie Holiday. I hear Billie Holiday all the way. So those are, I know two of his favorite, you know, artists, um, singers, but besides singing together, yes, there's just the connection of, um, with other singers, uh, you identify yourself in them yeah, uh-huh. I, I, I've seen the same thing consistently. I, I think that that's a really a magical thing, especially when you're touring, too, because it's like a... You mean like singers sticking together kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, just, you know, I, I would think, you know, the band's do, the band's always, the band's a band, the band's doing their thing, and then, but, you know, the singers are kind of checking on each other much more, and there's yeah, just a special it. kind of connection to that. It's a bond. Yeah, for sure. I think sometimes, though, depending on the situation, I mean, when I'm doing my solo thing, I only like I like I love um, my bandmates come first. You know, I'm always like I just want to hang out with them. I don't even like being in a dressing room alone too long because I want to hang out with my friends, you know, like before a show or something. I think because I come from like session singer or session person world, sometimes I would bond more just with the musicians because it was I mean, with the band members, I should say, um, just because there was a different, it was a different kind of hang. I can't explain it, you know, but the singers, you naturally have your bond. Between the record you worked on with Henry Hay and, um, your current project that you're working on with Charlie Hunter and also the project you have with Holly Palmer and Michelle Lewis. And mm-hmm. I think that, um, how did, how did, just in a general way, how did your thinking or was he, was, he, was this all very natural? Was this a natural unfolding or did you start to think about, I want to kind of organize myself in different projects or, or let, bring myself to your collaborations with Snarky Puppy and all of these, all of these different projects? Um, every project was super natural. There was, I'd never get antsy, like I need to do something new. I'm not, I always, I'm never bored. I've never really have been board I'm like I always in the sense of I always I'm very focused on a project when I'm when I've 
say, okay, this is what I'm, this, I'm actually going to do this for the next couple of months. This is like, I'm super into this. Um, but I've actually always been like that since I was a kid in the sense of, um, or not in the kid, but like early singer in early twenties in, in New York, I always had different projects and bands that I was working on. And that is one, one fuels the other, that one fuels the next one. Um, I like that energy. I like bouncing around. And then when one sort of like, like when I got together with Michelle Lewis and Holly Palmer, it was natural. We were singing a Christmas song actually at John Shanks, at John Shanks Christmas party in LA. And we sang a song together and it was like, Hey, let's start a group. Okay. I love this kind of 1940s tight Andrew sisters type of harmony kind of thing. Let's write the songs. Let's make them comical. We don't need another Andrew sisters group, but let's, we're all writers. Let's write and make people laugh. So we started doing like gigs in comedy clubs or, you know, cabaret clubs where they got, we were sort of sex in the city meets Andrew sisters with like a, a potty mouth, you know, uh, you know, galore, like just, we'd make people laugh. And that was fun for us. We, uh, it was such a different thing. We knew it wasn't going to be like the whole pie in the sky. Let's go get a record deal. That will always be one of our love dear projects because there's no ambition. It's just singing and writing songs and making each other laugh. That's was so natural to happen like that. The record with Henry was, I put it out on snarky puppies. Well, Michael league is the band leader of snarky puppy and it's his label called ground up. And, Michael League used to be my bass player in my band in like 2011. And he he just moved from Texas to New York. Henry said, yo, this guy, Mike, you got to get him in your band. He's amazing. He's like unbelievable. And he has this band called Snarky something. And they're great. So Mike came into my band and we did some touring together, Henry, Mike and I. And, and Mike said, um, hey, you should come and open for my band Snarky puppy we're doing this thing at rockwood music hall come up and sit sit in and sing a song at midnight we'll, we'll pick one of your songs and you just do it no rehearsal no sound check just trust us and that he did this night regularly with snarky puppy at rockwood music hall called vamp family dinner and he would have different artists come up and just do one song and it, that was a vibe that was such a natural thing to do and i couldn't believe what i had seen that band was unbelievable and so then I went on the road with them and started opening for them. And then we all started like writing and recording and touring and we're, you know, Charlie Hunter and I are going to open for them in November in Europe. Um, and I've opened for them for, for years and we have such a family vibe. And again, that was so natural. There's no ambition. It was just like, Hey, this feels good. Let's do this. Like, I think all of these projects I jump into just because it just feels good. And it's like, there's, who knows what the outcome is going to be? Same thing with Charlie Hunter. It was like he, he was working with a singer, um, Silvana Estrada, who's amazing. And she was from Mexico. She got her visa denied four days before the tour that they were going to do about over a year ago. She couldn't get in the country. And he called me. He goes, hey, we haven't worked together, but you like the blues. I like the blues. <laughs> Let's, uh, you know, want to want to be on this tour for the next three weeks. And I was like, sure. So you know, we text a bunch of song ideas back and forth to each other for the next three days and then jumped on the tour. And after four days, we knew that that was, we were going to make a record. So that we've been touring all throughout 2018. That's my main thing right now, which I love. He just landed today in Holland. So we're going to start a European tour in a couple of days. And did you guys know each other before he called you? Um, yeah, but we had met through because he also put out a record on the ground up um, on ground up music. So we had met through the snarky guys okay. a couple of years ago, but only twice, you know, it wasn't, he didn't really know my music. I didn't really know his music that well. We knew of each other. Um, and it was, but again, so natural, like, okay, let's go sing blues covers and do weird things like that. And I saw he's somebody who's been touring for 25 plus years, just getting in the car and just driving and hitting that, hitting that same market over and over and over and I have learned a whole different world about touring because of him. And that's only in the past year, which is crazy because I feel like I've always been touring. But this is like touring, like in the back of the van, squished up next to a kick drum for a month. Like, and I'm so happy. <laughs> that's great. You know, it's like what, I still what, love doing what I do. What are, what are a couple of tangible things that Charlie's taught you about touring? Um, 
Oh my God. Well, health is everything. Um, sleep and healthy, you know, good, good food. He doesn't drink. I have a little wine after a gig sometimes, but, um, uh, but health and sleep and working out, even if it's just 20 minutes, just to get that blood going. Like, I mean, it does not, it's not, it's just all about health. And especially as a singer, I have my little weird steamers and things that, you know, that I bring on tour and it's a very, it's only him and myself and, um, a drummer. We've rotated a few drummers this year. Jordan Pearlson just did a tour with us last month. Doug Belot from New Orleans, Derek Phillips, Derek and Keita and, uh, for a percussion player from Snarky Puppy. So we are just us three in the van and, we listen to good books. We listen to podcasts. We have good conversations. We stay healthy. And I think Charlie has toured so much that he vets every person <laughs> before he brings him in that small van and spends many, many weeks and long hours with them. So I think that you kind of know if the vibe is cool or not, but that that's a big, you're in close quarters, you know, you're, yeah, you're totally. together all the time. So I've learned in reading him how it's going to go down. It's how it's helped me vet, not vet people. It sounds so like FBI, no, but no, no, but it's true. I mean, personality has got a match to hang. I was literally, before I spoke to you, I was just having a um, Skype call with a young composer who just graduated from Manhattan school of music that John Deli wanted to introduce me to, to get kind of, he wanted to pick my brain about how to go about getting into it. And that's what I was saying. I said, you know, there's no debate. The music part has to be together. Mm -hmm. So let's take that off the table. Mm -hmm. And now it's about everything else about you. Mm -hmm. That's that's what the negotiation is about. Because, of course, you have to have a point of view creatively. You've got to have your skills together. You've got to – we don't – we're not going to talk about that part. We're mm -hmm. going to talk about the other part. Right. Because if that doesn't work, then this isn't going to work. Totally. You could sing your brains out. And if you're an a-hole, you're just not going to get called. <laughs> if you're demanding, totally. if you need, if you're demanding, if you're just, oh my God, just forget about it. Just change careers, you know? Yeah. You know, it's really cool too, to watch, watch this band kind of evolve too, because like I know Doug and I know Derek Phillips, yeah. um, who are both awesome. And it's yeah. so cool to see, um, cause I didn't know Derek Phillips in New York, but we met in Nashville. Oh, okay. And, um, it's so cool to see all, how there's all these incarnations of your group and, um, <laughs> how it's connected so many different worlds together. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's really cool. And every drummer, this is something I've learned so much from Charlie because he's a rock, he's a groove, he's solid. He can play with anybody. Um, but watching, we had Keita in the beginning just on percussion, Keita um, Ogawa from Snarky, just on percussion. And he has a really textural, colorful kit, so many cool sounds. And, um, and then Damon Grant came on, just pretty much cajon and a couple little small pieces, really like lockdown groove. And then Derek Phillips came in, and that was the first time I'd really played with a kit with with Charlie. Um, full kit and then then it got stinky then it got like funky in the sense of okay now we're it's less acoustic sounding and Derek is one of my favorite drummers in the world and so you know that's when I saw how Charlie really lets and really gets off on people improvising I'm not like a big improviser I'm in the moment and I'm you know I'm not just talking about like a little riff I mean um I'm talking about deep improv improvisation where Charlie comes from that. And when I see him working with someone, um, Doug has it, Derek has it. They're just in this flow and Charlie lets them breathe, like super breathe, you know, and they do their thing and all of their other personalities come out through their playing and they're changing time and they're changing. And you know, it's just the most beautiful thing to not only hear that person improvise, but watching Charlie let them fly and it's so f satisfying on and from and, and fulfilling to watch and be a part of on stage and I also think for the audience like whatever chair we're in I'm like oh my god like Doug sounds amazing right now and Charlie's so happy that he sounds amazing and that is part of the energy not just what's being played but 
how people are reacting to it or what we actually like physically feel from it. It's super, super cool vibe. And that, that's, that's something I've learned so much about just letting someone be like, who are you? And just play what, who you are. That's great. Honestly, I think that's a big part of why this project's connecting with people. You can feel that there's joy in the music. Yes. You really can feel that. Mm-hmm. It's about energy, and that's what people are picking up on. Yeah. That's actually pretty consistent, a consistent thing that people have told me, whatever city, whatever country. Well, we've only done America, but until this coming week. That's, that's about to change. I know. It's so exciting. <laughs> but I mean, uh, that every it's been a consistent thing after the show when – you know, talking to people, it's not just, oh my God, you guys sound great. And I love that song. And I've known Charlie since 92 and I've seen him this, but I, you know, it's not just those kinds of things. It's like, I love watching it. You can tell you guys have so much joy and they use the word joy. You can tell you guys have joy on stage when you play and you're listening to each other because we're laughing the whole time, but it's only because we're so, oh, it's just so much fun. We're just in it you know, and, um, that is a consistent comment that we've heard. And I've never really had that so consistently, like people commenting on that. They say, Oh, you look, people say you look like you're enjoying yourself so much. And you have, you can tell that you love to sing. Like people have said that, but to see joy amongst musicians on stage is because we're just always looking at each other and always in it. No matter. Totally. And that's important to me. And I love watching that too. That's why someone would pay money to go out and have an experience seeing music. They want to see magic makers. And especially, there's something so, you know, homespun about this that's so cool, in my opinion, that I, that I think is really great. Another thing that um, it seems like you're starting to do from just kind of seeing you on social media and things is you're starting to spend time in Europe every year consistently, and you're starting to get involved in projects here, uh, particularly in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. Yeah. Well, um, my father lives here. He's always lived here. We lived here until I was five. Um, and when my parents split, my mom took my brother and I to New York. My dad stayed here and remarried uh, a Dutch woman who's still my stepmom since I was seven. And um, so I realized at one point, well, I was already spending all my summers growing, you know, living in New York City, but spending every summer with him. I never actually thought I'd spend so much time here as an adult. Um, there was a point I had a couple of job opportunities or gig opportunities, people saying, what, you know, do you want to play in Holland? And I was like, I don't really have a band there. And then, you know, met somebody who knew somebody else and had a little trio and did a couple of gigs. And then I thought, oh, this is actually cool. Europe, um, they really, really like music and they really come out and they listen and they don't look at their cell phones when they're watching you. And this is so different. And so let me, let me come back and stretch out my trip further. I obviously had a place to live. My dad's here. And, um, and then I started meeting more musicians and then people asked me to give some master classes. And then I got started doing some big band stuff and then got a Dutch booker. And then, you know, so things were just, I just had to spend time here more doing that. I just got a voiceover agent for American accents in European ads. So there's, there's like kind of cool work that all, all work that I love to do. I love teaching. I'm not like a teacher and I'm not, not a voice teacher, but I love like, you know, like what you do, you're mentoring or working, uh, you know, giving master classes and uh, coaching sort of young singers or young artists. Um, and then I started doing a lot more in Denmark, e actually even more so than Holland. I have my Dutch community here and my band here that will jump over to Italy or Germany or Denmark. But I have a whole other scene in Denmark that I do, like a big band uh, that I work with there, this band, Tiptoe Big Band, and we've been working on and off together for a couple of years. And so then when I'm there, I jump into other projects, um, you know, just while I'm there or teaching at the school at schools and things like that. Um, but because I have two passports, I can make that world work. And I always, Holland is so much my home base, my whole life because my father was here. It's so natural to be here and Denmark's an hour away on a plane. So it's like basically flying to North Carolina from New York, you know, it's nothing. Sure. Sure. Totally. 
Uh, do you speak Dutch? It was my first language, but it's certainly gone away. So I speak like a five-year-old and I can order my food and train tickets. But I want to like come back here for a month and do a super intensive course and just be in school every day, five days, because it's in me. And I make all my friends try to speak Dutch with me, but it's very yeah, difficult it's, language. It's totally, it's, well, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's totally, you understand. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> it would be funny. But now I would hate to be in a band with you and Why Not, because then you guys could talk <laughs> behind my back. Exactly. You're building this rich life for yourself because you're having a life that's rich in experiences. I think that's one thing... I was teaching at a university a few years ago, and that's what I was saying to the the music students. I was like, mm. you have to go make opportunities. No one's going to do this for you. And it and it's not even, I mean, it's work, of course. We know it's work, but like that's a good thing. You can go and create opportunities, and that's part of manifesting a reality for yourself and not waiting for someone to come along and do it for you, which they're not going to. And you can build a really unique reality for yourself if you allow it as opposed to, um, you know, waiting to get the right yeah. booker and to bring your band from America to do this. And so many other things have to line up to make that even possible, which is so difficult, even at the top levels of all of this, that why not just start developing relationships and creating scenes? And I think that that's something that I think the younger generations of musicians are really good at with collaboration. Mm-hmm. And I think that's young, young musicians and older musicians can learn a lot from. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's, there's a whole like social media aspect, which we didn't come up with, which is sometimes, I mean, I can't, I also talk about this in like some of these master classes with young singers and artists, the selfie world is just, what is this? You know, they think that this is art and this, they, it's just basically like, I need, I need, um, compliments, you know, like pose pretty picture of myself. I'm making music and, and then they want everyone to just say, you look beautiful. You know, there's a really different kind of being, um, sharing your quote unquote art and music. And like I tell some of these students, if you're going to do a selfie and I, I've done selfies, certainly dressing rooms or you're on soundtrack, but what's your story? What's the story behind it? What do you, what do you, you know, what's, what's the deal? I don't get that world and I'm kind of going off on the tangent now, but there is something that they can learn. I don't know if it's something you can learn. Like how do you, un, how do you, pre- how do you try to live in a world where there's no world of social media? Because in the back of your mind and you want to get your stuff out there, you're, you're thinking of likes in the back of your mind or views, instant views, not going to a gig and playing for hopefully 50 people show up at your gig. It's like once you post it, you might have instant fans. Like it's and you don't even have to you can only you can post 59 seconds of the song and you'll have instant, you know, instant gratification, instant. Totally. High, high, high you know, like just highs left and right. How many times have you checked your Instagram that day? You know, and that's a dangerous thing for the young, young crowd, you know? Yeah. I um, think for any, I think for anybody, anybody honestly, yeah, for sure. That's the biggest thing. And, and that's what is cool to see you doing with the coaching masterclasses teaching is you got to look at it as you're trying to find your people, number one. Yeah. And number two, it's about um, helping people Yeah. and offer, you know, trying to figure out a way to add some positive value or something that's, you know, enriching to somebody else's experience. And, and that to me is where the magic of all of this is because then it's less transactional and that's the goal, like in, in the best moments. And I know that, um, it's a struggle and it should be a struggle because it's, you know, it's a process. It's a, it's a process you go through to kind of figure that out is to figure out how, you can actually add value much the way as you turn up to a little bar on a Friday night and play some music for people. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what this thing has to be about for it to, and, and then when you see it, like I was saying with your project um, with Charlie, it's, there's an authenticity that's immediate and you just get it. And you're, and if this is something you, a person would be into you guys, it's, it's resonant and it's real. So that person would be into it because it's it's not masked with anything that's 
you know, something else. You know, it's interesting that you're saying that because I just told somebody the other day that I was, when I was, when we were making the record and, or I was li- li- listening to mixes or something, and I said, I love this project so much. I love this band. I love these songs. I love the tour. I love everything about this project. I love Charlie. Um, but I, but I, I realize that if you don't like this music or if you don't like what we do, then we can't be friends. <laughs> I mean, I felt it wasn't like a protective thing. I was like, I actually, and it wasn't about liking the songs or liking how we sound. It was more like liking the energy. I was like, then we, you know, because you can't deny this, this, like, it feels really good. You might not even like funk. You might not like the blues. And if you don't like funk, then I don't know if we can be friends, but you know, it's sort of like, it's such a, if, it, there's just an, if you don't like what this stands for, then we're not of the same tribe. And you, you know what I'm saying? It's a completely, it's completely a, that that's what I felt. And I felt very, it was slightly like a protective thing over the music, but it was also, I haven't felt that in a really long time. Like if you don't get what we're doing, then I don't know who you are, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, our values are so yeah, misaligned. But, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. That, that's a really that's 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 amazing. Where are the best places for people to go to find out what you're up to? I guess website always best lucywoodward.com and then of course instagram.com backslash forward slash Miss Lucy Woodward. Lucy, Original. we haven't seen each other or spoken in so long. So, so you're sorry. awesome. Thank you. And you're awesome. I love what you're doing. This is great. You really want to get into the minds of I feel like we could talk another 2 hours. There's so much to say. I want I just want to say one thing when you say about you know, making music and, and, and passing on what you know, because you have so much experience and so many things that you've done as a writer, player, you know, everything and uh, producer. And I, and I, I do, I do relate. And it's a matter of passing on that baton or passing on what you know to younger people. I think it's part of our job and our duty sometimes um i think it's really important so it's cool to that you're doing this as a podcast it's not just like a quick in and out how do you write songs kind of thing it's like really this is a good conversation so i think that's i think that's a really cool really cool outlet for thanks Lucy. you and people on your show so thank you yeah you're welcome thank you for listening to the loud noise podcast i love to hear your feedback and want to make the show the best it can be Please leave me a comment or tweet me at Steve Walsh Music on Twitter. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a couple minutes and leave me a review on iTunes. It helps get the word out about the show, plus I'd really appreciate it. You can subscribe to Loud Noise and you'll receive new episodes with new conversations full of tips, time savers, and advice to take your music to the next level. So dig in, get out there, and make great music. Until we meet again further on up the road, cheers. Cheers.